Hey guys, this is Jan for Chess24. I'm back to the office after my road trip, which took me to Karlsruhe and Baden Baden, doing commentary with the great Peter Leiko on the Granke Chess Classic. And from Baden Baden, I went straight to the Thailand Open flight Frankfurt Bangkok, where I took place in a lovely tournament at the beach. The Thailand Open is the one place where I play every year. And in this video, we shall talk about what happened in my games. I'll focus on the openings. It's an opening link. So I'll try to tell you guys what I had prepared, where I think things went well, where I think things went wrong, and try to give you some insights into <laughs> my preparation <laughs> and in general how the tournament went. We will also touch upon some of the key moments of the tournament, which for me, which, spoiler alert, did not go very well. Anyway, let's get into the action. Round number one. Typically, in the first round, as a Grandmaster, in an open tournament, you do outrate your opponent by a significant margin. This one was not an exception. I had the black pieces against Duong, I believe, from Vietnam, whom I outrated by about 650 points. He played one e4. I had a little time to prepare. I think the pairings came out like maybe an hour or two hours before the round, but I had a brief look and I saw I did not really like what he did after my typical move, e4, e5, which if you have that much of a rating advantage, often you don't want to do stuff like that and allow, I think he was playing, I don't know, some four knights, which is not the most exciting of lines. So instead I played e4, g6. Can't claim that I'm a big expert on this. That's sort of a typical choice if you're black and want to play for a win against a lower rated opponent. After d4, bishop g7, knight c3, I played c6, which is, yeah, a line I used to play a lot in my youth. I'm not sure what this is called. The mm -hmm. Karo Pierce, maybe? I learned it a long time ago from, I think, a book from Dave Norwood winning. I don't, I'm not even sure it was in there. Winning with the modern, was it in there? I can't remember. Anyway, I played this a bit. It's not objectively a great line. I think white is better after f4, d5, e5. And I think white is also better after knight f3, if you go d5, h3. My opponent played h3, which is fine. I went d5 and here knight f3 would have transposed to that. When, yeah, I don't know what black is supposed to do. I probably would have played knight to h6 here. With the plan to play f6, knight f7, short castles, but it's objectively not the greatest of lines. Instead, my opponent went e takes d5, which is a mistake strategically, because after c d5 in the structure, the knight on c3 is not doing very well. So after that, I was already quite confident about the outcome of the opening battle. Knight to f3, knight to c6, bishop d3, knight h6. Now this plan made a lot of sense to me. Once again, intending to play castles, f6, knight f7, or maybe in some lines put the knight to f5. Looked like a decent enough choice. And after castles, castles. Knight to e2, which is logical, preparing c3, but allowing me to play knight to b4, more or less grabbing that bishop. I had very much won the opening battle. He went knight to g3, knight takes, queen takes, f6, rook e1, knight f7, and I've achieved everything that one can dream of in this line. The two bishops' prospects to play in the center and squares for all my pieces. So the opening went well. The rest of the game did not go all that well, to be perfectly honest. And my opponent played extremely well. I did not manage to put a lot of pressure. And this is a position we get roughly 40 moves later. Where all of a sudden you might be able to see that I have a certain lack of pawns. The position should be a draw, h4 is weak and it's simplified enough and so on, but I wasn't all that thrilled about the way things had gone. The one good move I made in this game was the move king back to e6 here, when in order to make a draw I guess whatever, rook h2 or something, would have been a better choice, but I had spotted that after king e6 he might be tempted to go c6 because after takes takes this will be a check and obviously only white can win. But c6 turned out, my opponent played that move, but it turned out to be a losing blunder because of rook b2 check, king a4, b5. 
he didn't go king a4, he resigned after rook b2, which must have been very painful for my opponent, but of course I was delighted to see it and I managed to escape the first round with a bit of a scare, which brought me to the second round game against one of Thailand's top players, Visu Wat, who I think has been participating in every Bangkok Open. This was the 18th edition, so he's been around. And I went 1d4. I prepared a bit for this game. He tends to favor the King's Indian and against this setup, which this all of a sudden, this tournament became a theme tournament for me in the G3 King's Indian. We'll see this around a lot, but this was the first time. I don't have a fixed repertoire against the King's Indian. I'm not particularly good about it or good against it. My results against the King's Indian are worse than against most other openings, but this g3, bishop g2 is probably sort of my default setting now. And I also, while I was in Karlsruhe doing commentary on the Grenke tournament, I bought a couple chess books. I had this big chess book stand and I picked up some. One of them was Boris Avro's book. I'm not sure what the title is, but it's a wide repertoire against knight f6, g6, recommending all these Fianchetto systems against the Grunfeld and the King's Indian. And one thing that's good about this Fianchetto system, if you play it against, especially let's say a low rated player that is a King's Indian player, they will very rarely only play these c6, d5 setups. You will normally get, like in this game, a setup with knight f6 and d6. And here I do believe that white has pretty decent chances to fight for an opening advantage with this Fian these Fianchetto systems. Having said all that, and we'll see more about that topic later, I very much lack feel and experience for these positions because I haven't played them very much with white. And that's something that I should work on. But for this game, things went more or less all right. He played a line I had seen in Avro's book and which he had played before, so I had read about this before the game. I hadn't spent that much time checking the details, as we'll see. But he played this move, queen b6, which I had seen what I think Pepe Cuenca played this against me once before. I went b3, which looks logical enough, intending to maybe Fianchetto the bishop, and black played e5. I think my game against... I maybe it was e5 against Pepe too, I can't remember. Anyway, e5, this is a line I had seen in the Avro book, and Avro recommended this move bishop to a3, which is not the main move here. I think the main moves are d5, or d takes e5, but bishop a3. Looked like a decent enough move, targeting that pawn, and I decided to follow the book. Rook to d8 is the best move, covering it. I went queen to d2, which was also recommended. Bishop to g4, rook a d1, and here in the book it only said bishop f3, bishop f3, and white is obviously better. But Visevat played a stronger move after rook a d1. He went knight to a6, just defending against my threat of d takes e5, followed by queen takes d8. And I realized things weren't that simple. Black actually has fairly fluid development and it's not so clear what my bishop is doing on a3. I went h3, which looked decent, but obviously it's a better version for black. He has a tempo on knight a6 and I had to go h3 instead of taking directly. The engine gives all kinds of funny moves here, like bishop back to b2 or queen back to c1. Maybe those were better, but too subtle for me. I went h3 and I've I had to see here after bishop f3, bishop f3, e takes d4, which was played, that I can't recapture on d4, because after takes, takes, rook d4, knight ft7, this I saw, is extremely strong, and rook d3, knight e5, I'll get in trouble. So you have to go, instead of queen takes d4, for the Zwischenzug, knight to a4, and here queen c7 was played, queen takes d4, and in this position, even from afar, but I hadn't really seen anything better, I was very worried about the move d5, which still seems to me like it's solving Black's problems. Black doesn't have the two bishops, but all his pieces are active. He has a tiny lead in, not really development, but yeah, in peace activity here. And I couldn't really see anything during the game. I was playing to play queen h4, but then after d takes c4, I think Black would have been more or less fine. And Wieswald should have played d5, which theoretically might mean that, yeah, maybe either white shouldn't go for this line or maybe play a different move here instead of queen d2. 
<clears throat> or instead of h3. Because to me it looks like after d5, black is perfectly fine. Instead he played queen to a5, which yeah was was a mistake because now I managed to stabilize and keep my two bishops and this generally advantageous structure. And after queen d2, queen f5, king g2, I managed to win that game quite easily by pushing my b-pawn. And yeah, <clears throat> that game was over on move 29, so this went well for me. Then round number three. I had the black pieces again against Akash Takur, or Thakur, sorry if I bungle the names, um, from India, who was mainly a 1e4 player I'd seen in my preparation. And yeah, I was as usual in the situation, 300 points higher rated, looking for ways to spice it up against 1e4, but turned out there was no real need to do so, because he was intending to play d4 against me. He played d4. Very often if you play against an e4 player who all of a sudden plays d4, it turns out that they have something very specific in mind, and often it's this line, knight to c3. This game was no exception. Playing the, I call it the very soft, but I believe it's called the, the very soft, which I always found a strange line because this knight on c3 is obviously misplaced, but it allows you to do battle on a very limited playing field and to prepare specifically for one game, which probably appealed to my opponent. He went bishop g5, nowadays bishop f4 is also played. I covered all these things in part 4 of my video series on chess 24, black repertoire against d4. But as usual, first of all, I could not exactly remember my recommendations. Well, I mean, I knew what I gave after bishop g5, but I was also playing this game that one only has to play if you normally publish all your analysis with myself wondering, has he seen my videos? Does he know what I've recommended? Has he only seen my games? In the past I've played knight b7 here twice. So sort of this guessing game. But in the end I decided I should practice what I preach and decide to play the move c5, which I also gave in my video series. My opponent blitz star bishop takes f6, g takes f6, e4. Once again, trying to keep things very specific and move by move. Like if you play e3, where black has a couple options. I think in my series I gave something like this and I thought black was fine. Which I still think, why wouldn't he be? Two bishops. e4 was played when I vaguely recall that black was perfectly all right after d takes e4. But that is about it. d takes e4, d takes c5. Um, no, I think I also knew that f5 was supposed to be a fine move here. So I played f5, queen takes d8, check, king takes d8, long castles check. And now recollection more or less told me that knight d7 or bishop d7 were both okay, but I knew zero details about either. So I started calculating around here. And knight d7 looked more logical to me somehow, keeping an eye on this guy. My opponent blitzed out g4. He was clearly following his preparation. After g4, I took, he blitzed out h3, and I started thinking a bit here. I, yeah, I couldn't remember anything about this position. In the end, I played the move g3, which is logical enough, not allowing him to open up files or diagonals after gh3, let's say. The move that the computer recommends didn't cross my mind, to be perfectly honest here but it's very strong or very obvious once you see it, is a move e4 to e3. Similar idea to mess up black white pawn structure a bit, but giving up this more stupid pawn on e4 if possible. After f takes e3, g3, black is obviously fine. And after h, g, e, f2, black should be doing all right as well. So e3 looks like a good move, but my solution was not horrible. I played g3, f takes g. Here, once again, I could play e3, but I decided, first of all, this pin was annoying me, and secondly, I had a feeling king c7. My opponent was still blitzing here. King c7 might not be the first computer move, and it's probably a good idea to get him out of book so I can start playing against him, not against his comp. And that worked because after king c7, he started thinking, and he played a move that I think is a mistake, the move bishop to c4. What I was expecting was knight takes e4. I wanted to go f5, knight c3, knight takes c5. In this position, I wasn't sure how to evaluate. I thought I was all right, but computer slightly prefers white, even though 
I'm not sure if that's correct. I thought with my two bishops I should be fine. But white clearly has some space in the center and I'll need some time to safeguard my king. So that's what white should have played. Instead he went bishop to c4 and after knight to e5, bishop b3, bishop to d7. I was quite optimistic about my chances. And rightly so, this is a good position for black. Knight g2 was played, I went e6. Compi doesn't like this, but I still think yeah. it's more or less fine, even though. Whatever mode the computer gives, it's probably better rook to d8 to bishop h6 check. Anyway, I was happy here. Then, okay, we're sort of out of the opening phase, but since it's a critical moment, I'll show you the next couple moves. Rook hf1 was played. Here, I should have played check and e3, which here yeah, is not hard to understand that the e pawn is probably more dangerous than the c pawn. I took here and started yeah, drifting a little bit here. Bishop e3, check, king b1, bishop c6, knight 2, c3. I still thought I was in good shape with my two bishops and passed pawn on the e file. But yeah, made an inaccurate move in this position, rook a d8, which I could have gotten punished for. He played the best move, rook e d1, bishop d4. This was another key situation. If white goes knight to g5, he's better. Targeting this pawn, I think my intention had been to go rook to d7. But rook to d7, I missed a little detail in form of bishop takes e6, which is not impossible to spot, frankly, but I believe that's what I missed. So knight g5 would have been unpleasant. It's not winning for white, but yeah, it would have put me on the defensive. Instead, my opponent committed a losing blunder, bishop a4, which looks very natural trying to get rid of this powerful bishop, but does allow a little tactic. Takes, takes, knight to f3. Took me some time spotting because, um, yeah, giving up this also powerful bishop for the knight is not the first thing that crosses your mind, but it turns out that just wins for black because there is not only the threat of knight takes e1, but also of knight d2, followed by knight f1. So it's game over. And yeah, I managed to win this position without a lot of drama. So three out of three so far, so good. Round number four, I was white again against international master, young man from India. And we continue our journey through the G3 Kings Indians. This game I was reasonably well prepared for. He had a lot of games also against strong opposition. So I thought at least if he's gonna stick to his lines, I will know what to expect, bishop g2. Um, castles, knight c3, d6, knight f3, and yeah, I think he had one game where he played. Maybe the same system like in round one, c6, queen b6, something like that. I know, yeah, one game where he played knight c6, castles a6, which is one of the main lines. This is a line I was always happy to face. Here I have a couple games with white. Um, and he had one game where he played the line he was going to play in our game, c6, castles. And bishop to f5, not queen b6, which we've seen in our last outing. Now, since he already played this, I decided to consult Avro's book. And Avro recommended the move knight to e1 here, which was also the move that was played against my opponent. And after d5, Avro said, this doesn't work because white is better after queen to b3. But the computer sort of disagreed. And mm, after queen to b6, Avro's line was c takes d, and he says queen b3. A, B, C, D, knight, D5 is good for white, but then I think only considers knight to C6 or as the main move. But as your computer will tell you, knight takes D5 here is a significant improvement. Bishop takes D5, knight C6, and I couldn't find anything for white. So I decided that knight E1 was not the way to go. There was a game, a game he had knight E1, D5, I think. So I played H3 against him, which might be a good move, but too complicated for me. I was looking for a way to surprise him and I came up with the move knight to g5, which looks stupid of course, but there's some point to it. First of all, with bishop to f5, black is signaling. He's intending to play knight to e4. So if we can, that's also the point of knight e1, stopping that and preparing e4. So if we can control that square and get an e4, that's good news. 
after knight e1, another line apart from d5 is also the move bishop to e6, which was recently played by Carlsen. It's also not ridiculous. So knight g5 stops that. And yeah, I was reasonably happy with my finding. It's not a novelty or anything, but I thought it would be a surprise for my opponent. And I was hoping he would play something like h6, when after e4, bishop g4, f3, bishop wherever. Knight h3. I like white's position. Full center, pieces develop easily. And yeah, I thought it was just better for white. But after knight g5, my opponent blitzed out d5. Showed me he was not surprised. Now I had considered this because after knight e1 he had also played g d5, but I had only very briefly switched on the computer and seen that the computer said here after knight g5, d5, that white was better, like 0, 050 or something. And that was good enough for me. I thought I'd figure it out over the board if this happened. But my opponent kept blitzing, so I wasn't quite sure I didn't ask him after the game. If he had prepared this and disagreed with the computer, or if he mixed stuff up, or if he thought after knight e1 it's the same. Anyway, it turns out this is not that bad for black either. It's the same line, like against knight e1 takes takes. Knight takes d5, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, knight c6. Now in the position with the knight on e1, I could not find anything for white here. Partially because after e3. Black has bishop h3, and you have to play something clumsy like knight g2 when e5 gives counterplay. So I thought, I was out of book here, but I thought, okay, looks very logical to play e3, defend this pawn, and he won't have this annoying nuisance of chasing me around with bishop h3. Which makes sense. My pawn played h6, and here my first thought was to play knight e4, which is also the computer's favorite move. But during the game I didn't like the position, or didn't like, I thought it was equal. After e6, forcing me to take, pawn takes, knight to c5 and e5, freeing the bishops. Now, the computer does disagree that it's equal. And since what I did in the game doesn't really give me an advantage either, I should have gone for this. Now takes, <clears throat> let's say bishop takes, and e4. And Compi is quite happy for white, because h6 is hanging. So I, yeah, definitely should have chosen that instead of what I did, which was knight back to f3, which leaves my position, my pieces slightly uncoordinated. I had seen what was about to happen in the game, but there's one key moment that, well, there's more than one key moment actually, where my opponent could have improved. He went rook fd8, which is logical, asking this bishop where he wants to go, Bishop c6, once again, looks like nothing to me. So I went here, and here he has a couple options. e5 looks all right. Computer even gives a6, which I didn't think of, but it's understandable that black should have full compensation here, because e5 will always open the position up, and my pieces are on sort of weird squares. Instead, my opponent went bishop to e4, and I was very proud of the maneuver I came up with, even though the computer, once again, laughs in my face. My face. And the computer says knight d2 is a good move, which I thought was a bad move because of bishop to c2. And I failed to find the best move here for white. It's a nice instructive move. Playing f4, stopping e5, and also preparing rook to f2 to potentially stare down that bishop on c2. Now, had I seen f4, I would have certainly played knight to d2. But instead, my plan was to play knight to e1, e5. I went f3, bishop d5. And here it came in handy for me that during the commentary in the Grand Chess Classic, Peter Leko, we had talked a lot about the Anderson knight on d3 in this Catalan position, where Ulf Anderson liked putting his knight on d3. So that pattern was very fresh in my mind. And I recalled that this knight can be dominant even if I give the pawn back after knight d3. I should be in good shape. My opponent obliged and went e takes d4. And I was very happy after e4. This structure is a nightmare for black because yeah, this knight blocks the d-pawn, the d-pawn stops the black pieces from activating, while white can very easily improve his own position on both sides. So even though the computer says equality here, like over the board, I was thrilled with this position and I still think it's not equal. Um, what my opponent should have done though is after knight d3, because my pieces are still sort of uncoordinated, is to wait a move, play rook ac8 and dare me to do something decent, because after d takes e5, when the position opens up, up, opens up, black will always be fine. Like here, d e, lose a piece after bishop c4, 
Banjo. White can't really open the position. So I would have had to make some waiting move. I was gonna play bishop d2. And black has a chance to improve his position further. Like Compi says f5. And black is all right, which is not hard to believe. Still, so ed happened and after e4, bishop c4, where rook d c8, f4. I was thrilled and went on to win a reasonably nice technical game. So I was happy with that one, even though my preparation once again was not really impressive because yeah. Or I was happy with the knight g5 idea, but I should have looked a bit more at d5. Might have saved me some um, anguish. Is that a word? Anyway, I won that game. So four out of four, so far so good. And next round, I was paired with Diego Flores in Grandmaster from Argentina, who had just won the Dubai Open. Big first prize at the Dubai Open and had also won his first, first four games here. So he was clearly in shape. I wasn't quite sure what to expect from Flores, who has a tricky repertoire. He's a bit like me. He plays one knight f3 or one d4 or one c4 and then tries to move order you into territory where he feels you might not be happy. So I wasn't sure what to expect, but in general I decided to play the Slav against everything. So if he was gonna play c4, I was gonna play c6. If he was gonna play d4, I was gonna go d5 and c6. And he went knight f3 and I went d5, c4, c6. Now, I'm well aware there's a move d4 and d takes c4 here, but sometimes you make these practical decisions when you're preparing, saying, okay, I'm gonna play the Slav set up against all the things and I don't have time to study the intricacies of 2d4 which isn't there anyway if my opponent were to play d4 knight of 6 c4 c6 let's say. So in c6 of course that allows white some extra options like e3 or g3 which I've both played myself once again trying to move order opponents but I was well at least I sort of had a game plan against both these moves so I wasn't that concerned. Instead he went d4, knight f6, knight c3, transposing back to the mainline position of the Slav. And I stuck with the game plan, which was to play d takes c4. Um, e6 is semi-Slav, is something I've done more often. But for this game I wanted d takes c4. I had not seen a lot of games of his with 5a4. So I thought this would, yeah, maybe put him into unfamiliar territory. And remember my words when we look at the next game. So I went d takes c4. To my surprise, my opponent blitzed out e4. This is, I think it's called the Slav Gambit, but it's never really been very popular after e4, b5. I was, when he played e4, I was a bit surprised because no one plays this. And I thought, okay, what, what did I miss? Am I gonna lose after e5, knight d5, a4? This is sort of the old mainline of the Slav Gambit, which I've never studied in much detail, but I knew that compies are very happy here after e6, a, b, knight c3. B, C, C takes B5, they say. The white attack doesn't really work. So yeah, that was the amount of knowledge I had after 5 e 4 And I was curious to see what he was up to. Curious is the wrong word. Anxious. He just played bishop E2. I went E6, which looks logical, at least to a semi-slav player like me. And you don't want to start with bishop B7, allowing any E5, E6 in such a position. So I went e6, castles bishop to b7, and my opponent blitzed out the move b3, which recently had been played, as I learned after the game, I'd never seen this, by the very strong young Russian player and theoretician Daniel Dubov, who's been con contributing a lot to opening theory. And once again, I had never seen this position, and it's never fun if your opponent blitzes out some gambit line, and you have to find your way through. So I spent some time here after b3, and I was very pleased with my reaction. Not because it's whatever the best reaction computer-wise, but I thought it was a very good human reaction. Now there's three moves I considered here. One is c takes b3, when I wasn't sure what he was gonna do. Like I thought probably queen takes b3 with compensation. I later learned that even d5 directly here is a move with a total mess. So I didn't really spend that much time on cb because I didn't look, like the look of it. And probably rightly so, because CBD5 against Compropration, I wouldn't have enjoyed very much. The move I mainly considered here was the move bishop to b4. When, yeah, white could go bishop b2 or queen c2, but then I can grab another pawn if I wanted to. Like, let's say queen c2 takes, takes, takes. 
takes, knight takes e4, and two pawns are two pawns. Like the, even here, I wasn't sure there might be compensation, but I gave up on the bishop b4 idea when I saw that this could be missed, or I didn't really calculate it, but my spider senses started ringing somewhere around here. And there, once again, this is not something you want against a prepared opponent. So I went for option number three, which is also a very logical move. I played the move b5 to b4. If white played knight a4 here after c3, I think black should be fine with this powerful pass pawn. I didn't really see that big an initiative for white. I go a5 at some point, maybe bishop a6. Of course, if you can get in c5, it's always great. So I thought this has to be a right. Therefore, I expected the move e5, which my opponent blitzed out. And here, this is where my practical decision came in. I decided, okay, I will play knight d5, because knight fd7, knight e4 does look like a lot of compensation and a mess. Even c3, knight fg5, you probably don't survive. But I decided I want to go knight d5. Now if he goes knight e4, c3, I should be fine. I have squares for all my pieces, bishop e7, knight bd7. But uh, of course, knight d5 does return the pawn, which... They wouldn't have done in the old days, but nowadays people are often happy to return a gambited pawn for clarity. Um, but this position, at least from afar, looked fairly fine to me. It's like a good version of this semi-tarash or whatever it's called, these openings Kramnik is playing, where you often get this structure with the pawn on b6. So I thought this was fine and played bishop e7, even though I have to admit that I had missed from afar, that after a3, a5, this happened. I want to keep the pawn here. A takes B, A takes B. I just thought rook A8, bishop A8, and I'll be thrilled about my position. But I had missed this tricky little check, bishop B5 check. The point is, if he, let's say, takes and now gives us check, I would just play bishop C6 and claim I'm better. <clears throat> Which might or might not be true, but anyway, black has no problems. But after bishop B5 check first, of course, bishop C6, rook takes A8 is not ideal. So... Instead, I had to find a way to stay in the game. King f8 didn't really please me. Sometimes you can play something like that, but it's a fairly desperate move. Knight c6 I considered, but didn't really seem to work, because after takes, takes, d5, e takes d, knight d4. Well, computer says bishop g5 is even stronger, I hadn't seen that. But I thought knight d4, the white initiative, just looks too dangerous to my mind. Castles knight to f5. And I was very unhappy with this. So more or less by elimination, I arrived at the move knight to d7. But even knight d7, you have to be very sure it works. Because after rook takes a8, if I had to play bishop a8, then I can more or less resign after queen a4, because I'm never getting out of this pin. But fortunately for me, even though it took me way too long to figure all this out, I had the move queen takes a8, stopping queen a4, bishop d7, king d7 is no problem. And black is more or less okay. I'd expect a queen c2 when it seems like queen a5 hitting the bishop seems to work for black. <clears throat> Instead, I probably played bishop to d2 and I ended up getting a pretty decent position. <clears throat> Here, if black is allowed to castle and support the b-pawn, he's better. So Flores, probably rightly at least from a practical perspective, decided to muddy the waters by going for d5. I took it. <clears throat> and knight to d4. And this position with hindsight is the moment where my tournament turned. Because I had more time than him here. He had like 10 minutes. I still had more than half an hour. And I tried to calculate knight takes e5, which to my mind is the obvious move. Grab another pawn and see what happens. But I'm not sure if it's psychological, I don't think so. I think it was just a calculation mistake. After knight takes e5, I was scared of rook to e1. For, there's actually many faults with this, so maybe I should have just spent more time. But what I had missed is after knight to d3, rook takes e7, king takes e7, queen c2. I thought it was a problem, which it would be if I had to move the knight, knight e5, queen c5 check. And at the very least, white is very much in the game. But there is the move rook to a8, which just wins the game pretty much, threatening rook a1. 
and if white plays whatever a3, then there's already many ways that lead to Rome. One of them would be rook to a3, just keeping an eye on the knight. So had I seen rook a8, I think I would have gone for this. Um, now, rook to e1 is not the best move. The computer more or less hangs in there with queen to e1. But after that, this is not hard to calculate. Only black can be better in a couple of ways, let's say knight g6, knight f5, short castles, and black remains with an extra pawn, or more ambitiously, play f6. Maybe white holds, but here, yeah, white would have had to answer some questions. But having talked myself out of this, or, yeah, I'm not sure if I talked myself out of this, but then I thought, why do I need all that nonsense? I can just castle, and I still don't see a good move for white if he goes knight f5, knight takes e5, seems fine. And e6 also didn't really bother me. I can go knight e5, or I can take, or knight c5. Everything looked fine. So I castled, but I completely missed the move queen c6, which really shouldn't happen, having half an hour on the clock since it's such an obvious move. And after queen c6, white is pretty much fine. I thought about rook b8 here, but then e6, and there's just nothing that black can do. So instead, after queen c6, I more or less had to or I didn't have to rule BA well, also leading to the same result. But the game bail out to a draw, which is a result that's fine, but sometimes you can, yeah, feel that you might have missed a chance to put more pressure. And yeah, I had that feeling even before consulting the computer. Even though, once again, I was not upset about the result, but sometimes you stop your own momentum a little bit with decisions like this short castles. So I might take C5 and that, yeah. I felt was something that happened. Still, four and a half out of five, so far so good. Who would have thought that the second half would turn into a nightmare? Yeah, nightmare is a bit strong, but I did lose a lot of rating points in the four games that were still to come. And the main culprit putting me on tilt was our friend Anton Smirnov from Australia. Young grandmaster, I'm not sure how old he is these days. 15, maybe 16, 17. I don't know, somewhere in that neighborhood. No, he's, he's older than 15, 16 or 17, I would guess. Anyway, Anton, I had the white pieces. I went knight of three, d5, d4, knight of six, c4. Went for the Slav and I was quite well prepared if he were to go e6, which is the setup he had preferred until then. But remember that I just told you guys that I thought maybe d takes c4 would come as a surprise to Flores when I played it one day before with the black pieces. And Smirnov blitzed out d takes c4, which according to my base he had never done, came as a big surprise to me. And this is, it's a bit of a weakness I have, or I'm not sure, might be too general. I am, I think everybody is pro, but I am much stronger when I can follow my own preparation. And, when he blitzed out d takes c4, it kind of annoyed me that I don't really have a repertoire against this because normally um, I will only either go for it if I have something specific in mind or I will avoid d takes c4 lines by playing e3 here or by playing knight c3 followed by e3 early. So after knight takes c3, d takes c4, I was getting a bit of my own medicine. I played a4, I didn't really feel like repeating Flores's line with e4. I played a4, he played bishop f5. And I was trying to figure out where I could hit him. You have a choice between e3 and knight e5 here. Those are the two main moves. And I recall that I had some ideas after knight e5, knight bd7, which is what most people do nowadays. Knight takes c4, queen c7. And here, yeah, there's a lot of theory after g3, e5. But I had some clue and I had once prepared it very well for a game against Inarchiv. And I wasn't completely up to date, but I thought at least, you know, I don't mind discussing that stuff. So it went knight e5, but once again I had guessed wrong because his intention was e6. Now the point of knight e5 is to play f3 followed by e4. And once again I thought e6, okay if I go f3, will he really go bishop b4? Most people don't do that nowadays. I thought maybe he's gonna go c5 and I can play this boring end game, which is a little better for white after e4, bishop g6, bishop b3, which I used to play with black myself, so it wasn't much fun. But Instead, he went for the move bishop to b4. And that is a line that I haven't looked at for quite a while, I have to admit. Like, this used to be part of my black repertoire, so it's 
Not that I'm clueless here, but in this game I felt, I didn't feel like going for the main line with e4, takes, takes, bishop d2, takes, takes, <clears throat> king d2, queen d5, king c2, knight a6. You get stuff like this, knight takes c4 castles. And yeah, I used to analyze these positions with queen e5 and rook b8 or rook e8 or rook d8. It's complicated and most people think that y is a little better here, which is why it's not popular for white. Well, not that popular for black, but I did not feel like being shown his preparation here, even though with hindsight I obviously should have. And you can't really bluff knight e5 and f3 and then not follow through. But I was thinking, is there any way where I can get him out of the main lines here? And then I recalled, or I thought I recalled, that I once had done some work on the move king to f2 which looks dumb, but the point is to go e4 without running into this bishop takes e4 piece sacrifice. And I thought, okay, let's do that. Now, the small issue with this is that the line I actually had done work on is knight takes e4, short castles, followed by king f2, which is a perfectly respectable line. I don't know if white is better or not, like main line is something like stuff like this. <laughs> or not, so knight to a2, and who knows? The game continues. It's a very playable line. But it's sort of important to start with knight takes c4 castles and then king f2, because after my move king to f2 immediately, white is more or less lost after the reply, which he blitzed out. He didn't even have to think, he just blitzed out bishop c2, as if this king f2 was the line he had fully expected me to play. And white is more or less lost. So now I started to realize that something had gone wrong First I thought, maybe this works, but it really doesn't, because after bishop d1, knight takes d8, he takes, and if I recapture, I'm a piece down. So, yeah, bishop c2 was a bit of a cold shower, queen c2, queen d4, just looks fairly hopeless. I played what looked like the most resilient move, queen d2, after a bit of shaking head, bishop b3, e4, yeah, yeah, I was disgusted with the position, c5 looks good, what he played, b5 also looked good. But after b5, a, b, c, b, I thought I saw some tactics that might allow me at least to continue the game. I went for the move queen to g5. My plan was after queen d4, bishop e3, this will be hanging, this will be hanging, things aren't so bad. And if he castles, this was my plan. I can take on b5. And I'll be right. Which is not the case, but... Nah, might as well show you guys here. Because knight takes b5, loses, which I had missed in this position. So knight e4, f takes e, f6. Remember this idea, double attack, and the very uncommon thing that f takes e5 will also be a discovered check. Now I hadn't seen this, and neither had my opponent, because here he took a little time, I wasn't sure if it was still a book or not, but he took a little time, so I guess not. He went bishop takes c3, b takes c3, and now short castles, when I still didn't like my position, I'm still a pawn down for not all that much, but at least I have the two bishops for now, my center is safe, so things aren't that bad. And in this position I spent like half an hour trying to decide pretty much between two moves, between h4 and queen to g3. Now the white plan to get compensation, yeah, should normally involve pushing your h-pawn up the board, and what bothered me after h4 was the move knight fd7 forcing the exchange of more pieces. And I was calculating all kinds of nonsense after knight fd7, if I can go knight g4, queen g5, hg, if in such an endgame I have enough compensation or not. And in the end I decided, yeah, it's all right, let's do that. The alternative queen g3, which here yeah, keeps the queens on the board, but I thought, okay, I don't need the queen on g3 in all the lines, and sometimes I might want to go h4 and then h5, and I was just comparing this. Um, these lines to each other, but it completely escaped my attention. What I realized the minute my hand touched the h pawn that here this tactic we have talked about earlier still winning after knight e4, f6, f and white can pretty much resign, which I didn't do yet, but not a pleasant moment. Every chess player knows this. You make your move, press the clock, and you realize, oof, I just blundered horribly, and this game is now gone. I mean, the main culprit is still my move king f2, but had I played queen g3 here, at least there's a fight ahead. I, probably white is worse, but things aren't that clear. 
instead after h4, yeah, knight e4, f6. E, f6. I could have resigned right here. I dragged the game on for another. Not very long. Eight, nine moves. But there's not much to talk about after f takes e5. It's just resigns. So that was painful and not something that happens to me very often. First of all, yeah, I don't lose many white games and I'm also not lost with white very often after eight moves. So this king f2 is weird. And I don't know if it's lack of practice or resilience when surprised in the opening or whatever. But of course, without remembering details, I should at least double check that it really is the move king f2 and not knight takes c4 followed by king f2. Because yeah, the move is not to blame. This is a completely respectable line, which might have been a better choice than testing him in the main line with e4. But yeah, that wasn't ideal. So I lost that game and that put me slightly on tilt. So in the next round, as it happens in an open, if you lose a game, you'll get a much lower rated opponent. And I was white against a player, I believe from in Indonesia. I think Indonesia. Hope I'm not mixing this up. Andika Petra 22-13. Mm, and spoiler alert, this game didn't go very well either. We did get another G3 Kings Indian. So it was back to those lovely waters. Different move order. I had prepared for the game, but he didn't really have any reliable games in the database. There were a few, but they were sort of all over the place, like Knight of 3, D6 or an early C5. So I didn't really know what to expect against this system. Mm -hmm. But he did play this setup with Knight BD7 followed by E5, which to my mind is the main setup for black here. And somehow maybe I was a bit punch drunk from the day before, but I also hadn't really studied Avro's book, book very carefully, all these lines very carefully, after e4, c6, h3, which is the main move. And I decided, okay, let's try to get him out of book by playing b3 here. Not the main move, but a respectable enough move. It's not terrible. He played e d, knight takes d4. The point of delaying h3 is that in some lines it's useful for white to go, like f3, bishop e3 which is harder to do if your pawn's already on a tree. And so he took and rook e8, and my plan with b3, and I think also the most common move here, was to play bishop e3. But now when this position arrived on the board, I started wondering what happens if he goes knight c5. I should go f3, what else, and d5. So I spent quite some time calculating this. I had seen the trick knight c6, b c, bishop c5, but somehow, yeah, I couldn't get myself to play this position after bishop to a6. I thought black has too much compensation. The computer disagrees. The computer gives f4 here and why is better. I didn't see the move f4. But yeah, somehow I started getting into my own head a bit here and I avoided the most natural move, bishop to e3. And went for the move rook to b1, which is a little cryptic. Like, okay, it's a generally useful move, but it doesn't feel like it's priority number one here. To move your rook one square to the side. Anyway, he went knight c5. Now f3, d5 is no longer great, so I went rook to e1. He went knight g4, threatening some knight f2 business, followed by or some. In some lines, knight f2 followed by queen f6, or queen f6 directly. So I had to proceed with caution, which I managed. I went f3. He went queen b6, which I had anticipated. Point is that after fg, but you can go knight e6, but probably you can even take here first. And things are hanging on this diagonal, so black would get a pretty good position. But I had intended to meet queen b6 with the move I played, knight c to e2. When I thought it was fine, I had expected knight to e6 here, trying to once again use this pin. And I wanted bishop b2, knight e3, I thought queen d2, knight g2, king g2. And as often in these g3 lines, once white stabilizes, he's often better because the pawn on d6 is a bit of a weakness. Now, this isn't terrible for black, but I thought this is quite playable for me at the very least. And I was looking forward to it. My opponent played a stronger move though. He went knight e5, kept more pieces on the board. I went bishop e3. And here the computer says d5 was a strong move, but no one in their right mind would play d5 allowing b4. So. That was not to be expected. He played a5, which is a much more natural move. And I went knight to f4, which I think is a decent move, but I once again blundered something while playing it. So 
after knight f4, what I missed and what I saw when I played it is that black has f5, e takes f, knight e to d3, which didn't happen, but it's still not something one should allow. The computer says whatever, knight takes d3, rook takes e3, knight f2 holds for white, but it's already some very weird lines takes. And how does it go? Queen g8, king g7, queen e7, king g8, f6, that I would have had to figure out. So once again, yes, being a little punch drunk from the game before, I got very annoyed with myself when I went knight f4 and spotted this f5, e f knight e3 trick. But instead, I couldn't believe my eyes when my opponent went g5 instead, which is a fairly horrible move. And I went knight h5 in this position, more or less just winning. Um, Black has weakened his king and given my knight a great square for no particular reason. After bishop h8, I will take a pass here because it's painful to look at it. Um, I did not manage to win this position against a much lower rated opponent in the game. Ended in a draw. And yeah, this game still upset me. Like the one upsets me. The one against Smirnov, that can happen or shouldn't happen. Opening disaster and then blundered. An uncommon tactic, but not to win this position is... Fairly un unforgivable. And even now, looking at it, I still can't understand how it happened. It did happen, however, <laughs> and the game ended. And yeah, I'll show you one key moment where I did something really, really bad in this position. This is also painful for me to look at because this position is still totally winning. Um, or, yeah, it's pretty much totally winning. But I decided on the move knight takes d6, which might keep an advantage, but it's such a horrible practical decision just for the sake of a pawn. Now I like grabbing pawns, but to give up that piece and to give his bishop scope is something one really should not do. And some bad moves later, I have to agree to a move repetition somewhere around here. F4, bishop, b4, bishop, e3, bishop, c5. So that was very painful and yeah, not, not a good game. Like in the opening I was maybe a little too obsessed with getting him out of book, which shouldn't really be the plan. If you're white against a lower rated opponent, you can just play book and have them show they've done their homework. But yeah, none of it mattered because I got a winning position after the opening, so I can't complain too much. I'm not winning this one, yeah. I'm really annoyed about it. Anyway, life goes on. There were still two, ga two games to play. And in round number eight, I faced Women Grandmaster Bhakti from India, who I had played before in a Bangkok Open a couple of years before. I had the black pieces and she's a good theoretician after d4. I had to figure out a way to maybe, yeah, once again, get her out of book. This was Kamta, big theoretician Jan is trying to get everybody out of book. Um, so I had to figure out a way and I remember I had bought another chess book in Karlsruhe and I decided to follow that one. It's Mathieu Cornet's book on the Ragozin. Now the Ragozin is d4, knight f6, let's say c4, e6, knight f3, d5, knight c3, bishop b4, which is as theoretical as it gets. But he also had a little bonus chapter in the end on d4, d5, c4, e6, and if white plays knight c3, now to play the move bishop to b4, which is what I decided to do in this game. It's maybe not the greatest of lines, but it's a, I thought it's a decent way. First of all, this position is not very common. And secondly, it will often get you a more or less unbalanced position, implying that we often want to change this bishop for a knight. And it's a little different from the Nimzo Indian, at least in some of the lines of white could play. My opponent played the move e3. I went knight to f6. Now, of course, it's not that different from the Nimzo Indian. Because after d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3. Bishop b4, e3. If black were to play d5, we'd get the same position. But most people don't play d5, but instead they castle here. And with good reason. Because after e3, knight f6, I believe the critical move is to play a3. And after takes, takes. Now, if white had, black had castles instead of playing d5, we would not go d5 here, offering the exchange of these double pawns. Instead, black would play c5 and so on. So this is the position I was actually hoping to get. It might be better for white. But after castles, at least it's very unbalanced. Mm. Or, mm. So I thought it might not be a great position, but at least, you know, there will be stuff to play for. Instead, my opponent played 
<clears throat> bishop to d3. Reasonable developing move, of course. And I forgot what I had read in the book. The book gave the move e5, which looks like a decent enough move. It, actually, it's an idea I know of because I once... Hmm, how does this go? I once played this knight c3, bishop b4, which is the same position, just with the pawn on c6 already. So the theme is not foreign to me, but here I managed to <coughs> forget this option. It's not the end of the world, it's not like black is better after e5, it's just a cute playable little move. But instead I went d takes c4, which is also a very playable move. Bishop takes c4, castles, knight f3, c5, short castles. And once again, I decided to follow a system I had seen in the book, <clears throat> knight to c6, when what I could recall is it was talking about a3, bishop a5, and after dc5, there's always this idea to go bishop c3, bc, spoiling the white pawn structure, and now play something like queen a5 with an unbalanced position. So I thought, I'm clever, I'll go knight to 6 and I'll get this unbalanced position. I can play for a win. But my opponent went for the move d takes c5, and here I started shaking my head, because this is more or less the opposite of an unbalanced position. I was trying to make bishop c3 work, but it's really not great here. No, sorry, white takes here first, I believe. Mm. Actually, they're both fine. But, but this position, the big difference is there's no pawn on a3, so if I go, let's say, knight e4, white can go bishop to a3, cover the c5 pawn. And I didn't like it, I didn't like my winning chances, and I did. I just thought that black is much worse here, so I decided I can't do that. Then I considered queen e7 after dc5, but queen e7, queen d6 also did not really, um, yeah, instill me with a lot of confidence about my winning chances. So in the end, I had to go for the move bishop takes c5, but that means that we've reached a symmetrical position where it's white to move after nine moves which is not exactly what my game plan was to unbalance things. Still, life goes on. My opponent played a3, I went queen e7, gotta keep the queens on the board at least. And after b4, bishop d6, bishop b2, bishop d7. These positions there, I have a lot of experience with this structure, because you often get it from the Vienna or the Semislav things I dabble with, and they're normally not that dead, so I wasn't too unhappy here. Still, after knight e5, this is more or less this old Rubinstein wisdom in these positions. It's very important that you have to be the first to get in knight e5 or knight e4. So you could argue for both sides that maybe white should have gone for a quicker bishop d3, knight e4, or queen c2 and sending knight e4. Um, but I thought it was time to play knight e5, even though white could counter this with knight e4 is not a stupid move. Knight takes c4, knight f6, which I guess is roughly equal. The black king is a little weakened, but black gets the two bishops. So I thought I'd get this knight e5 then, and after knight e5, bishop e5, I still wasn't happy in this position. It's, it is quite dry, and I was afraid that something like bishop b5 would happen, exchanging more pieces, when I did not like my chances to win it. But I was happy to see that my opponent played move f4 here which is more ambitious, but also gives me a lot more chances. Bishop back to b8, e4, and I now already seen the strong move a5 here, freeing the a7 square, and meeting e5 with knight g4, which reminds me of some of these classic Rubinstein games that, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people have seen. Like, what is it, Rode Levy Rubinstein? He had some masterpieces in these structures. So, yeah, the opening went well here, and it also turns out that black is better after knight g4, because b4 is hanging, and the black counterplay is very, very strong all of a sudden. And after further adventures, I went on to win that game, which got me slightly off tilt, but of course the tournament at this point, I wasn't really playing for any, for first prize anymore, that was completely out of reach. Um, and in the last round, I faced another opponent, I outraged it significantly, and history would more or less repeat itself from, which game was it, round number seven. We got yet another one, and probably, I'm not blaming my opponents for this, like, King's Indian is a very, very popular opening, 
And I do still have the belief that in these structures where black plays d6, white has a good chance for an advantage. So I decided to stick with them, also trying to gain some more experience in them for future use. But I was getting a little sick of them at this point as well. Anyway, I decided to add sort of a new wrinkle, normally because of whatever move order I had been playing before, I was always getting these c4, knight, c3 positions. But here, after my opponent went d6, I decided to play b3 instead. Once again, there weren't a lot of games from my opponent, I believe, from the Philippines, but I had learned my lesson. He had six out of eight, and I was thinking that it's probably a dangerous, underrated opponent, which turned out to be very true. So I went b3, the point of it being that if black goes, let's say, knight bd7, bishop b2, e5, now white doesn't play with c4, but let's say you take on e5, and there's some theory here after knight g4, but I like these positions for white. Then you go c4 or knight c3 or whatever. These, this is pleasant to play for white. So it's not so easy for black to get in his standard setup. My opponent decided to get it anyway by playing c6, bishop b2, queen c7, c4, knight bd7. But here black has already committed to queen c7, which should be advantageous for white in many lines. I played knight c3 now, e5, e4. There's alternatives, rook c1 is fine, but this is all right here. Having forced the queen to c7, this should be a better version of the stuff I had in round number seven, for example. He went rook to e8. I went rook e1, which is also fine. But after a5, I'm very upset about the decision I took here, even though it's sort of instructive, so maybe we can all learn from it. Um, the move I wanted to play, and the move I should have played, is rook to c1, keeping the tension, just putting the rook on a better square, facing the black queen on the c file. But what bothered me, and not wrongly so, is that after e takes d4, I thought I had to go knight takes d4, he would play knight c5, and there's a lot of themes I have to deal with here. Queen b6 followed by a4 is there. There's this knight fd7, knight e5 maneuver, which we already know, or knight g4, knight e5, when the d3 square is vulnerable. So, long story short, I didn't like this option. And therefore, I decided to avoid it and play the move d5, which is not a great move in this structure, or in this particular position with the bishop on b2. What I missed is that after a5, rook c1, e takes d4, White has the very strong move, queen takes d4, which, yeah, I just didn't consider it during the game. Once you see it, it's the most natural move in the world. Knight takes e4 clearly doesn't work, well, for multiple reasons, but one convincing one takes, followed by knight d5 check and knight c7. Not a tactic that I'm not able to see. And the big point is that after queen d4, black is not in time to coordinate his pieces with knight c5, which now would run into e5, white wins. So after queen d4, white, to my mind, is already significantly better. This is the structure you really want. Of course, ed4 is not forced. But if not ed4, it's not clear what black's next move is. And after rook c1, yeah, white's position just seems very nice. So note to self, next time around, consider taking on d4 with the queen. If black delays it for so long. Instead, I played d5 which is sort of a typical reaction in positions like this when black goes rook e8, because the common wisdom is the rook is better on f8 for d5 structures, but it's not great with the bishop on b2, and the bishop on b2 is sort of silly for these structures as well. It's better if you have played like h3, bishop e3, then d5 makes a lot more sense. Here, my opponent got a fairly decent position, making actually yeah, natural but good moves, rook eb8, preparing c takes d, followed by b5, yeah, I didn't like my position here and was more or less cursing myself why I had gone for this d5. Computer says a4 here, but it's such an ugly move to make to yeah, allow this knight to stick around on c5 forever and give up any queenside activity. I went a3 instead, but after cd, cd, b5, b4, takes, takes. Black had achieved a fairly good position, knight takes a4. Both rook a4 and b a4 are right here. I had calculated all this ba, bishop h3, bishop h6, b5. Um, but yeah, I didn't think I was better at all. Rook to a5, bishop d3. Here, black could just have taken on b5, which I think leads to a fairly equal position after where well, takes, 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 queen to a4. Mm, let's say rook b6. 
black is perfectly fine. Instead my opponent decided to give me a chance by playing the move bishop to e8. I'm not sure what that move is about, trying to bring the knight here. After which I managed to get a good position, but I once again did not manage to win it, which is upsetting and slightly worrying. I should be able to win such positions against much lower rated opposition. But once again, it didn't happen. The key moment here was, okay, I sacrifice an exchange, which is all right. Takes, takes, bishop f8. But here I started going astray. I went bishop c4, followed by knight d2, allowing d5, bishop f8, dc, bishop d6. For some reason I had stopped calculating here, thinking, okay, with my passed pawns getting the exchange back, I'll be in good shape. But after knight to e8, black just wins the b5 pawn and the position peters out to a draw. Which, this one I wasn't as upset about as the one in round, whichever it was, seven. Because my opponent, I felt, played fairly well and I, I wasn't that sure during the game where I had actually gone wrong, except for this d5 in the opening, but okay, such things happen. Turns out that in serve bishop c4, I should just have played king to g2, when white is significantly better, which is what my gut feeling said. But yeah, you always gotta win those games. So that brings us to the end of the tournament, as you can see. Last four rounds were a disaster for me. Two out of four against much, much lower rated players. Cost me a bag of rating points and also meant that I didn't finish. I think I finished 11th. Didn't finish highly in the tournament. Six and a half out of nine. That's of course a big disappointment, especially after the fairly decent start. And yeah, I'm pissed, which is, can I say pissed on the show? I'm annoyed, which, yeah, first of all, I can win those ratings back, which won't be easy because I don't play much. But sometimes it's good to get annoyed because it will hopefully make me work on some chess. Especially my white repertoire. Okay, there was only small sample size because it was all these random King's Indians, which aren't that theoretically challenging. And the one Slav where I committed suicide in move eight. But it feels like it was a little stale and I'm gonna have to figure out some ideas for white. And then yeah, I'm gonna have to figure out a way to avoid big blunders, but that often goes hand in hand. Like if you get a good opening and you're confident and you get a rhythm, then your hand also makes fewer mistakes. But we shall see. For now, I'm unhappy about it since yeah, it's my one tournament per year. So of course I wanna do better than that. Normally I've been doing well in the Thailand Open. I had a similar disaster in, when was it? 2012 maybe, maybe 2014. One of the editions where I also did very badly. And it often happens that yeah, once you get stuck slightly below the top, that you get to face a lot of very, very tricky, slightly underrated, or that's an excuse, but tricky players that you, you have to make your way through if you don't match things. Um, can and ugly like this one. You can tell I'm still annoyed, but yeah, I hope you guys still enjoyed this video, could learn a little something about what to do and what not to do. I'll be back in the next Thailand Open at the very least. I'll probably play some chess before that as well. And hopefully I'll be doing better then. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. See you on Chess24.